Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Debar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Shvius, Chapter 4, Halacha 2, and so far we have not gotten into anything about penalties yet. Uh, we've gone through um, almost half of the Masechet, and we're only going to start looking at penalties now. So, yes, this is going to now be talking about the penalties that are imposed for Shvius violation, and it's going to bring up a uh, conversation about Bet Shemai, Bet Hillel, this is going to be one of the few cases where Bet Hillel is going to be stringent on the Shvius violations and Bet Shemai is going to be lenient. And this actually does make it, this debate actually does make it into idios. So the question is going to be, and what this mission is going to cover, is what violations are going to warrant a penalty and what violations are not going to warrant a penalty. And the Hazanish, uh, Rashi, Tosfot, and Rambam uh, understand that a penalty is warrant for Shvius violations that is going to be either a biblical one or involve a significant agricultural act. And this significant agricultural act that is going to be defined by the Rosh and his commentary in the Mishnah, and he's going to define it as uh, something that brings improvement to the ground itself. And Rashi and Gittin over there is going to imply that the sole criterion is whether the Shvius violation is going to be biblical or Darabhanan. And that theme is going to be coming up uh, throughout this. By the way, you can find this uh, in Gittin 44b on this conversation over there. Now, Mishnah starts off, and it says, uh, A field that was cleared of thorns during Shvius may be sown the year after Shvius, but if it was improved or it had animals penned on it to fertilize it, it may not be sown the year after Shvius. So we covered this before about penning up the animals in the field. And, you know, this came up in Halakha, uh, chapter 3, Halakha 3. And the idea is that, you know, if you have animals that are penned up for the point of trying to fertilize this field, um, and the intent is to fertilize the field, then you can't use it, you can't use the field in the eighth year. And that's going to be part of the penalty that was already covered. Uh, but what's interesting here, because it has to say something new that we didn't cover yet, if the intention of, pen, of penning up the animals is not going to be to fertilize the field, but just hold the animals, then if the manure is deposited, and by the way, they have to shovel it out, uh, then a Shvius law would not have been violated and a penalty would not be imposed. So the, the Rambam, in his commentary here, uh, is is uh, permitting penned animals in the field even for the purpose of fertilizing the field, and even if the manure is not removed, but only fertilizing by hand in the regular manner is going to be prohibited. So according to the Rambam, this is referring to a field that's fertilized not by penned animals, but by hand. So there has to be a difference here between here and what we covered in Chapter 3. And the Pnei Moshe here is 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 thinking that perhaps, according to the Rambam, a field fertilized by penned animals uh, would be here, and then the mission is limiting the area in which one may pen the animals for this purpose. And this mission is teaching that if the enclosure contained the animals and it's going to be bigger than prescribed, a penalty is going to be imposed. So we had in Chapter 3 a, a size of how big that pen has to be, and it was two bet say over there. And the Pnei Moshe is positing that perhaps this mission is trying to teach uh, a penalty about a bigger Im, uh, enclosure because you'd be spreading more of this dung and manure over the field. So that's going to be an issue because, again, something has to be a little bit different in this mission because we already learned this in chapter three. 
So what's going to be the difference? Now, one of the other things about clearing the field with thorns, um, you know, one of the ideas over there is that, you know, yeah, this is a prohibited labor and he is permit, he is doing a prohibited later, but, uh, labor, but the owner of the field is not being penalized because clearing a field is neither a biblical prohibition and it's not a significant act. And Rashi is, is pointing out in his commentary in Bahorot 34b that it brings no improvement to the ground itself and it does not completely prepare the field for planting. That's what is making this act a little bit different. Now, according to the Rashi over there, 34b in Bahorot, this leniency is applying only to a field cleared of thorns that were detached from the ground and scattered in the field. And clearing a field full of thorns that are attached to the ground may not be. So uh, clearing a field, says Rashi, uh, and, and implied by previous uh, Gemara, we had in Shvius that, you know, a field cleared of thorns that were attached to the ground may not be sown the year after Shvius. And removing the detached thorns that are attached to the ground, that's going to be prohibited uh, rabbinically. And, uh, you know, uprooting these, I'm sorry, uprooting these thorns is, is uh, that are attached to the ground is, is going to be a biblical prohibition because you're you're actually um, you're actually uh, preparing the grounds like plowing and it's it's preparing the land for growing so again what we had when this came up before clearing thorns this is kind of like uh, clearing tumbleweed and the Hazanish um, is is uh, is holding like the Rambam here in Hilchos uh, Shemitah 114. And basically, uh, the Hazanish is suggesting that although even uprooting thorns is only a rabbinic prohibition during Shvius, since doing so on the Shabbos would be a biblical transgression, it is treating more stringently during Shvius as well. So that's a slightly different interpretation than what Rashi is pointing out. Rashi's holding that uh, uprooting the the thorn bushes that are actually um, rooted in the ground is actually going to be a a, a deraita a deraita uh, prohibition, and the mission now is going to consider the status of produce that grow in a in a result of shvius being violated. And somebody went and did one of these malahas that shvius says you're not allowed to do, like you know plowing a field. And uh, the Mishnah starts and says, regarding a field that was improved during Shvius, Bet Shemai says one may not eat its Shvius produce. So Bet Shemai in this part is holding that a penalty is imposed for bidding such uh, produce uh, even to those who did not perform the labor. And that's the note by the Rosh Cerulio. So Effectively, this Mishnah says the Rosh Cerulio is implying that Bet Shemai is imposing a penalty for plowing but not for penning the animals in contrast to the previous penalty imposed by the Mishnah regarding sowing the field after Shvius. So this prohibition that Bet Shemai is holding is that one may not eat Shvius produce. That's not just the farmer. That's also a person buying it in the marketplace. In other words, nobody's allowed to eat it. Bet Hillel says one may eat its Shvius produce. So Bet Hillel here is holding that the produce is forbidden only to the owner of the field who did the forbidden labor, but not anyone else. And since Shvius produce is going to be ownerless, says Arash Cerulio, he cannot render prohibited that which is not his. And Arash Cerulio says since the halacha follows Bet Hillel, the produce of a field in which the forbidden work was done may be consumed. And the Rosh Cerulio is going to be pointing out that Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel disagree only regarding 
uh, fruit grown on trees, says the Rosh, or the Rosh, I mean, and vegetable species that are not usually cultivated, to which the prohibition of sefachim and aftergrowth does not apply. Uh, others are going to be suggesting that this dispute has ramifications even with regard to produce uh, that is in the prohibition of sefachim and uh, that it's going to be uh, broader than just fruit. So then we talk about this consumption of shvias produce from fields. Again, we covered this in Masechet Peah. There's a disagreement between Bet Hillel and Bet Shemai on the status of ownerless produce. And so basically, Bet Hillel's position is that, hey, the nature of Shia's produce is ownerless anyway. So they're going to prohibit this person so that he can't benefit from it because he, he violated uh, a malaha for Shia's. But according to Bet Hillel, and it comes up in this uh, argument that occurs twice in Masechet Peah, if you went and declared something ownerless or created something that was ownerless in the case of uh, pl planting a field in Shvias, and then you were to go prohibit it to poor people or you were to go prohibit it to all other people, then it's not really ownerless because it assumes that you've actually taken ownership of it in order to prohibit it to a certain class of people. Therefore, it's not ownerless. So this arguments coming up again in that nature of who is ownerless and who is not. And Bet Hillel say, saying, since you never owned it, you can't prohibit other people from eating this produce. So this is a deeper argument that comes up between Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai. Bet Shammai holds that it is permissible to leave things to Hefker and then to prohibit, uh, say, like rich people from gathering paya, for example. And so Bet Hillel says, well, if you're leaving it out, uh, you can't make a condition because you've already left it out. So you can't say that uh, only, you know, this class of people can come and collect it. In the case over there, you know, the case over there was that you had some rich people coming to collect the pay on behalf of poor people. And so Bet Shammai is excluding over there um, certain classes of people. And, and Bet Hillel says you can't because you've already left it out and you can't, you can't adjust it. So that case is coming up now. And now we're talking about the consumption of the Shvias produce from the fields in which the laws of the you know, Shvias were violated. And now we're going to be talking about the consumption of the Shvias produce from fields in which the laws of Shvias have been, you know, were observed. And so Bet Shammai says one may not eat Shvias produce from another's field with an expression of gratitude to the field's owner. So according to the Rambam in Hilchas Shemitah 615, this is saying that it means to return a favor, either, either directly giving the owner of the field Shvias produce or making an arrangement with him where he's going to allow him to gather Shvias produce from his own field. Now, according to the Ravad, this is meaning that this is even to give a verbal thank you to the owner. And this is going to be prohibited because Shvias produce is ownerless. So if you're expressing gratitude to the owner of the field, then you're giving the impression that the field was not really released for public consumption. Again, this idea is that when something is ownerless, it is truly ownerless. So if you are coming and saying thank you, then it really in some way wasn't ownerless because it's not yours. That crop that grows on your field is not your crop. You have to even leave it to the wild animals. And so it is really not yours. So somebody coming and saying thank you or is coming and trying to make an arrangement where I'll collect from yours and you collect from mine, that is going to suggest some form of ownership. This is not 
yours. It is not uh, owner. There's no owner to it. And in fact, you don't have to tithe ownerless produce. So the Gemara is going. The mission is going to continue. And Bet Hillel says that one may eat shvius produce from another's field, either with or without an expression of gratitude to the field's owner. Now, this opinion uh, is clear that we're not worried about thanking the owner, and it's also, you know, clear that they don't worry about an expression of, hey, maybe this property wasn't released to the public. And really, the point of this is that uh, Bet Shemai is effectively, or Bet Hillel is effectively saying, it's not yours at all. So, you know, somebody thanks you or doesn't thank you, it doesn't mean anything. It's like they didn't say anything. That's the idea. Now, I will say this, Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel do agree that expressing gratitude does create the impression that the field was not released uh, to the public for consumption. But Bet Hillel's point is not worried about this, since even if it's not released, the produce is still permitted. And so Bet Hillel is holding that, you know, one may also eat without an expression of gratitude, is either with an expression of gratitude or without an expression of gratitude, in other words, it's open to everybody to eat. So, um, you know, I mean, what what definitely, you know, would be prohibited is if, you know, somebody has a field here and it's Shvias and you're going to try to charge money to come and collect. That definitely you're not allowed to do because it's ownerless. So the idea is that, is that uh, you know, Bet Shemai, and Bet Hillel, you know, do agree that, um, you know, we want to make sure that somebody doesn't become accustomed to entering another person's field without permission. And, you know, certainly, um, you know, there there would be uh, an agreement that, you know, definitely you want to make sure that the, you know, field is released and everything else. But if the person expresses gratitude or doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's ownerless. So it's like he didn't say anything. I think that's the point of uh, Bet Hillel here. And Rabbi Yuda says about this in this Mishnah, the opinions are actually reversed. In other words, Rabbi Yuda is teaching that it was Bet Hillel who said that one may not eat Shia's produce with an expression of gratitude to the owner while Bet Shemai permitted it. And again, this is going to be implying that uh, that this is going to be uh, recorded in Idios, and in fact it is in Idios 5.1. Idios over there is talking about a dispute between Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel, and, you know, cases where Bet Hillel is in all cases going to be more strict, and in all cases Bet Shemai is going to be more lenient. That's the trick to be in Idios, so that if there's any part of Bet Shammai's position that is going to be stricter and in all other cases going to be lenient, it's not going to work. So that it's only the cases over there that all cases and all possibilities where Bet Hillel is always more strict and Bet Shammai is always more lenient. So this, you know, is going to be one of those cases where uh, if it's like Rabbi Yudah, and certainly this is recorded in idios like this, so that it's actually reversed, so that it's actually going to be uh, Bet Hillel, who in all cases is going to be more strict, and Bet Shemai in all cases is going to be more lenient here. So uh, that's going to be uh, something to, uh, to keep in mind. And Rabbi Yuda says the opinions are reversed, and th this matter is counted among the lenient decisions of Bet Shemai and the stringent opinions of Bet Hillel. So that's interesting to note. And it's also interesting to note that um, the previous opinion uh, was brought up and then uh, Rabbi Yud is pointing out, no, that's actually not the case. It's actually switched. So sometimes uh, these sorts of things can be recorded so that if somebody comes and says that, oh, I have a tradition 
that that Hillel says, you know, one may, um, you know, you know, one may say thanks or or not thanks, um, then you would say to them, no, actually, that that tradition is not correct. It's actually reversed. So that um, this is, you know, being recorded to make sure that, you know, it's very clear that, you know, this is actually going to be reversed and that there's no tradition out there um, that mixes it up. Um, so the Mishnah says that a field that was cleared of thorns during Shvias, so uh, the Gemara is now going to give two definitions of the phrases for clearing it. It's going to say there in Bavel, they say that it refers to a field whose thorns were removed. But here, the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael say that it refers to a field from the time it was plowed uh, after the thorns had been removed. So the Mishnah is basically teaching that a penalty was not imposed if the field was plowed only once, and it is even permitted in the first place. But, uh, you know, this is implying that a single plowing not only does not warrant a penalty, but is permitted, and the reason for this is going to be explained. So that's a big hiddish here, and according to the rabbis of Bavel, the first case of the Mishnah refers to a field whose thorns were removed, and so the second case is talking about, in this Mishnah, a field that was improved, and that can refer to a field that was implowed. So according to the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael, this first case is is already referring to a field that was plowed. So the Gemara asks, according to the rabbis here in Eretz Yisrael, what does a field that was improved refer to? And says that it cannot refer to a field that was plowed, because that is what the first case refers to. And the Gemara answers that according to the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael, there are two types of plowings. So this is going to be a, a new Hiddish here, that there are two types of plowings. The Gemara says that all the people plow once, but he, the one who does uh, this plowing, is going to plow twice, according to the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael. And this is going to be referring to a field that was plowed only once, and um, that... So basically, the the idea in the in the Mishnah is that you know the wording is saying is referring to the wording in the in the Mishnah is saying sade uh, shinit kov tsa, and that is basically going to be a question of does this word mean that it was plowed once or it was plowed twice. And the idea is that, you know, if, you know, there was a single plowing, it's going to be permitted and it's not going to be a penalty. And although this Mishnah is teaching that the penalty was not imposed, if the field is plowed only once, it is permitted in the first place. So that's big, Kiddush, big surprise. Now, the second plowing is going to be forbidden. That's going to have the penalty. So according to the rabbis of Babel, this, uh, this uh, tiyuv is referring to the first standard plowing. And so they're saying that even a single plowing warrants a penalty. And the uh, word in the mission is also going to be tiyuv. And that's going to be a question of, does this mean that it was plowed once or plowed twice? And the Gemara is going to ask, but is it really so that according to the rabbis here in Eretz Yisrael, it is permitted to plow once in Shvius? So, you know, the Gemara is going to be asking, the rabbis in Israel allow you to plow the, sh the field in Shvius once? And uh, that's a big surprise. The Gemara is going to be answering that. The rabbis of Eretz Yisrael understand this mission to be discussing plowing done uh, under duress. And it is indeed that the rabbis of Bavel and the rabbis of Eretz Yisrael disagree. So this is this is a, a new thing that comes up here. And Rabbi Yossi, son of Rabbi Bon, is going to explain it and say in this Gemara, they are in Bavel, they understand the, the Mishnah to be discussing a case 
where the government does not coerce people to work the fields in order to pay the taxes. And therefore, all plowing, even the first one, warrants a penalty. But here in Eretz Yisrael, they understand the mission to be discussing a case where the government does coerce people to work the fields in order to pay the taxes. So basically, this first plowing is going to be required to produce a yield large enough to fulfill the tax quota, and that's going to be permitted. And basically, you know, this is when the land was under uh, Roman uh, conquest, and basically they said, you're not allowed to leave a field vacant. You have to pay your taxes. We don't care about your 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 Torah laws and everything else. In fact, they were trying to stamp out Torah. So what would happen was uh, the government over there would not allow you to leave the field fallow. And so what they did was they say, I don't care what you do. You have to plow it and you have to produce something. You have to pay your taxes on the field. So in this case, the rabbis in Eretz Yisrael are talking about a case where the government is forcing the people to work the field and pay a tax and not leave it fallow. And so that's why they're saying that this first plowing, which is required to produce a yield, is only enough to pay this tax to the Roman government. And a second plowing uh, would be where, um, you know, it it would be for like your personal use. That's the plowing that would be a violation of the Shvius penalty because now you've already paid your tax quota. And, you know, the second plowing uh, could be needed only to increase that yield. Um, but it's uh, not only prohibited, but it would also warrant a penalty. So basically the second plowing would be to to be like, well, look, I'm already plowing once for the government. I may as well come and plow and, and grow again for myself. So you're not allowed to increase that yield from what you've already been producing. The first part is just to pay the tax to the government. And just because you've started you know, working the field to pay a tax, you're not required to to keep to keep going there's no uh, allowance to come and try to increase the yield uh, for your own personal benefit just because you started uh, plowing and going and so because of government force uh, the rabbis are going to permit plowing once during Shvius because of the situation that occurred during the Roman times and the Gemara is going to relate that during uh, the Amorim, the times of the Amorim, and when they were under Roman persecution here in Eretz Yisrael, the Gemara says that originally when the government coerced people to plow the fields, Rabbi Yenai ruled that people may plow the field first, and that's going to be a standard plowing. In other words, the idea here is that to pay this government tax quota put on by the Romans, one must not only plow, but plant the field. And so uh, this is talking about that Rabbi Yanai is, is actually going to be allowing planting. You can see this parallel to the Bavli and Sanhedrin 26a. And the, the idea is that what this is trying to teach is that this is not a permit to get rid of Shias. This is not a permit in this time to start having an allowance where you can start planting now for your own self, that this is only to pay the tax bill. And after that tax bill has been done and you know, you, you're done with that tax quota, that you are prohibited just like uh, the rest of Shvius and Shvius still stands and that this is only used because we are being coerced. And this is not because this is a waiver on the laws of Shvius, and it's not to be understood that way. So, you know, the idea is going to be, you know, where, you know, this Mishnah is talking about a period of time where, you know, the government did coerce people to work the land for the sake of taxes. 
Now, over there in Sanhedrin, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be talking about a time where um, the government also coerced people to work the land for taxes. Um, but uh, you could read over there uh, that um, over here in Shvius that you could read it like how the Babylonians are, are reading it, where it's talking about a time where the government did not coerce people to work the land for the sake of taxes. So that that's uh, you know that's kind of what's going on. Um, what the Gemara wants to make sure is that we're not allowing a second growing where people will become Shvius gatherers, where people will become Shvius merchants, and that they'll use this excuse of the oppressors coming and forcing us to pay tax on this land that you know they've basically colonized and basically turning us into a country of Shvius gatherers and, you know, gathering uh, merchant merchandise from the fields to go sell, uh, that's going to be a serious violation of Shvius. And there's a lot of laws about how, you know, a Shvius merchant is not qualified to be a witness, things like that. And it wants to make sure that we're disqualifying Shvius vendors, and we're disqualifying uh, this dishonest practice of trying to grow so that you can get an economic benefit. Again, the field that you know has any vegetable or fruit growing out of it on Shvius, this is hefker. This is free for every person to take, rich or poor, and this is also important for poor people as well. And, you know, you can't, you can't have ownership of it. This is not yours. Yeah, that's your field. But biblically speaking, this is not your produce, not during Shvius. And so the Gemara, you know, is pointing out that, you know, this is talking about a time when it's only, you know, coercion, and then they're going to allow a, you know, a first plowing and planting and they're going to be allowing this because uh, they they have no choice. They have to pay the tax or else. And the Gemara now is going to talk about an incident that occurred after the government rescinded its decree. Uh, and, you know, then the Roman government allowed the Jews to observe the laws of Shvius. And so the Gemara says, after the oppressive decree was rescinded, after the oppressive decree was rescinded, Rabbi Yanai observed that the populace supposed that this allowance to plow during Shvius was permanent. And he said to them, when I permitted you to plow during Shvius and to plant, uh, did I permanently annul the prohibition against such plowing? No, I didn't. I only gave you a temporary dispensation to prevent the government from persecuting you because you didn't pay your taxes and you are you are in error in supposing that the government that this allowance and leniency is permanent in other words that they were saying that look this is not a law by the rabbis to waive shvius and rabbi yanai is telling the population that this allowance to plow and plant during shvius was not meant to be permanent it's a temporary measure because there's government coercion, there's government persecution, and you're going to be in big trouble if you don't pay your Roman taxes. And they're going to really, uh, really come down on you. And so this is basically going to be prohibiting a second plowing. And then when this uh, law from the Roman government was waived and they went back to allowing the Jews to observe the laws of Shias, then uh you know then you know they're not allowed to plow even to plow and plant even the first time they have to go back to how the laws were so the gemara is going to talk about a ruling by the tanaim that would eventually question rabbi yanai's dispensation permitting him to plow during shvius 
And Rabbi Yaakov Barzavdi asked in the presence of Rabbi Abahu, did Rabbi Zera and Rabbi Yochanan say in the name of Rabbi uh, Yanai, and did not Rabbi Yirmiya and Rabbi Yochanan say in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben uh, Yetzodak that the sages took a vote on this matter and decided in the attic of uh, Nithza's house in Lod. Nithza is the name of a person, and the attic is used to uh, convey that there was a meeting place by Tanayim there. And um, the uh, the Gemara goes like this. It says, concerning the entire Torah, from where do we derive that if a non-Jew commands a Jew to transgress any of the commandments that are stated in the Torah, other than idol worship, illicit relations with an erva or murder, the Jew should transgress the prohibition and not allow himself to be killed. And this ruling is based on the verse that states in Leviticus 18.5, you shall guard my decrees and my laws that every man shall carry out and by which he will live. So this is implying that you should live by God's laws and not die by them. And that if a person is in a life-threatening situation, he should transgress a prohibition to save his life. And the source is mandating that one should sacrifice his life rather than engage in these three cardinal sins like murder like relations with a relative or idol worship. So the sages in in this attic qualified this ruling that uh, when given the choice between sinning and being killed, a person should sin rather than be killed. And the Gemara is going to question whether Rabbi Yanai's dispensation is going to be based on this disqualification. And the Gemara says that... Uh, they further decided that this was said and applies only when one is forced to transgress in private, but not in public. And even if the non-Jew commands him to violate only a minor mitzvah, he may not listen to him, but rather must let himself be killed. And basically, the Torah now is going to another verse in, in Leviticus 22.32, where the Torah commands us to sanctify God's holy name out of love of him. And when someone sins in public, he not only violates the law forbidding the act, he also desecrates God's name because he is publicly uh, flouting God's will. And he must give his life rather than desecrate his name. And the Gemara is going to continue. And it's going to say, as Lulianus and Pappas, his brother, did in the following incident. So this, by the way, you can see in Bavli Tanis 18b. The story is paralleled over there. And the Gemara says that non-Jews offered them water in a colored glass, and they did not accept it from them, but rather gave up their lives. And this is that, you know, they refused to drink water from a certain type of glass used by non-Jews, uh, and drinking it from this glass would have been an infraction of the prohibition against following the practices of the Gentiles. And so refusing to drink from this glass is an example of a minor mitzvah which one must give up his life rather than violate the pub violate in public. So this is also going to be in Bavli 74b. Um, and it's going to give another example where somebody refused to wear shoelaces that were normally worn by Gentiles. And the idea is that, you know, we never want to deviate from being Jews. And we always want to live a life where we are distinctively Jews. And we want to do Jewish things. And even in this case, where Lulianus and Pappas' his brother were forced to drink uh, from a colored glass, which was in vogue, and this is what the non-Jews drank from at the time, the Jews always wanted to live according to the Torah and the community and custom of the Jews and not integrate with the non-Jews in any way. And that is the right way to live and to stay away from these alien ideas 
because you know we want to stay connected with Jewish thinking. We want to stay connected with the Jewish people. We want to stay connected with Hashem and with the Jewish lifestyle. And so we want to have total connection to Jewish tradition. And we don't want any part of following the ways of the non-Jews. And in fact, the Torah says, you know, not to follow the ways of, you know, the Amorites and the non-Jews. You have to, you have to stay connected to Jewish tradition. And Rabbi Yaakov Bar Zavdi is going to ask Rabbi Abahu how Rabbi Yanai would and could permit plowing, which is done publicly during Shvias. And yes, the non-payment of the taxes could lead to death. And the question is, you know, if this is going to be forced and, you know, person, you know, could be plowing on Shvias and, you know, it's going to look like he's going to be, you know, sacrificing his life uh, publicly uh, for the sake of preserving a mitzvah. And Rabbi Abahu is going to answer by qualifying the clarification. Rabbi Abahu says, the government's intention in wanting Jews to plow during Shvias is not to force the Jews to violate the Torah. Rather, their intention is only self-interest, it's to collect the taxes. So the idea is that only when the coercion is religious in nature do we sacrifice the life rather than publicly violate a mitzvah. So, you know, this is in a case where, you know, in conclusion, if a non-Jew coerces a Jew to violate any mitzvah other than these three cardinal mitzvot, a Jew should do so unless there's two considerations that are met. One is that the violation is public. And two is that the purpose of the coercion is religious. In other words, the non-Jew wants to force a Jew to violate one of the mitzvot. So during a period of oppressive government decrees, one must allow oneself to be killed rather than sin even privately. And Rabbi Yanai is basically ruling that the government and this Gemara is dealing with just such a, a situation where the government is not trying to get rid of Judaism. Uh, it just the motivation of wanting the the tax money is it just wants its money, its self interest, it has to pay for its wars, and so it needs it needs capital to do so. And so that this thing of prohibiting Shvias is not being done because it's trying to wipe out Judaism per se. In which case then you can't plow it publicly. You can't plow it. You can't do this. But if it's only to take money uh, and it's only uh, because it's trying to fund its wars and it has nothing to do with religion, then it's going to be a different situation. The Gemara is going to clarify the teaching that Jews must give up his life rather than sin in public. And it says how many people must be present for it to be considered a public transgression and the rabbis of uh Kesarin says 10 Jewish people, for it is written regarding the obligation to give one's life rather than sin in public, and I shall be sanctified among uh, the children of Israel. And among refers to 10 Jewish people. So the verse is teaching that one should give up his life to avoid sinning in the presence of 10 Jewish people. And the Gemara is now going to cite an incident to prove that only when the coercion is religious in nature must one sacrifice his life rather than publicly violate a mitzvah. And Rabbi Avuna Zera was seen to be running behind a laden donkey on the Sabbath, and he was permitted to desecrate the Sabbath publicly because the non-Jew who coerced him did so out of self-interest as a means of transporting packages, not because of a religious reason. And the Gemara is going to give another incident. Rabbi Yona and Rabbi Yosa ruled that the people may bake bread on the Shabbos for the Roman general Ursinus. Ur Ursinus. And Ursinus was a Roman general who resided in Antioch, and uh, he demanded it. Basically, the people weren't baking to break Shabbos. And he wasn't forcing them. He didn't care about forcing the people to work on Shabbos because of a religious thing. He just wanted his warm bread. 
Now, Rabbi Mana is going to say, I asked the following question before Rabbi Yonah, my father. There are four Rabbi Manas in the Yerushalmi. Uh, this one is going to be the one that is the Rabbi Mana, who is the son of Rabbi Yonah. Rabbi Yonah was the head of an academy. And uh, so this is an earlier Rabbi Mana. This is not the later Rabbi Mana who uh, was the head of the academy. So the Rabbi Mana who was the head of the academy uh, in the north in Sipori, uh, he's one of the last commentators in the Yerushalmi. Anyway, this is a different Rabbi Mana. And the Gemara says that did not Rabbi Zerah and Rabbi Yochanan say in the name of Rabbi Yenai, and did not Rabbi Yermia and Rabbi Yochanan say in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yitzadak, the sages took a vote on the matter and decided in the attic of Nithza's house in Lod concerning the entire Torah. And from where do we derive that if a non-Jew commands a Jew to transgress any of the commandments they are, that are stated in the Torah, other than idol worship, illicit relations with an erva or murder, that the Jew should transgress the prohibition and not allow himself to be sin, uh, to be killed. And basically it is from this verse that we stated in Leviticus, that is stated in Leviticus 18.5, you shall guard my decrees and my laws that man shall carry out and by which he shall live. So... The sages in, Nitz, in Nitz's addict qualified the ruling that other than these three cardinal sins, when given the choice between sinning and being killed, a person should sin rather than be killed. And this Gemara is going to, is going to question regarding Rabbi Yonah, Rabbi Yona, Rabbi Yosa's dispensation on this. So they further decided in this addict that uh, this was said, and applies only when one is forced to transgress in private, but not in public. And even if he is commanded to violate only a minor mitzvah, he may not listen to him, but rather must let himself be killed, as Ulianus and Pappus, his brother, did in the following incident, when the non-Jews offered them water in a colored glass, and they did not accept it from them, but rather gave up their lives. Again, this was being done out of force. And Rabbi Mana is basically asking his father, Rabbi Yona, how could he permit a public desecration on the Shabbos? And although disobeying a Roman general may lead to death, one must sacrifice his life rather than publicly violate a mitzvah. And Rabbi Yona is going to answer this. Rabbi Yona says, Ursinus' intention in wanting the Jews to bake on Shabbos is not to force the Jews to violate the Torah. Rather, his intention is, one of self-interest, it's just to eat warm bread. So when the coercion is a religious matter and religious in nature, and the idea is to undermine the, the religion, one must sacrifice his life rather than publicly violate that mitzvah. And the Gemara is going to clarify this teaching that a Jew must give up his life rather than sin in public. And it says, how many... People must be present, present to be considered a public transgression. The rabbis of Kesarin said, uh, 10 Jewish people, for it is written regarding the obligation to give one's life rather than sin in public, and I shall be sanctified among the presence of 10 uh, among the children of Israel. And this is basically saying in a uh, group of 10 Jewish people. Now, the Gemara is teaching that a Jew must sacrifice his life to sanctify Hashem's name. And the Gemara is going to question whether a non-Jew is required to do the same thing. Rabbi Avuna inquired in the presence of Rabbi Imi regarding non-Jews that are commanded to sacrifice their lives in order to sanctify God's name. And Rabbi Imi replied and answered and replied to him and says in this Gemara, it was written regarding the obligation to give one's life rather than sin in public and I shall be sanctified among the children of Israel. And from this, we learn that Jews are commanded to sacrifice their lives in order to sanctify God's name, but non-Jews are not commanded to sacrifice their lives in order to sanctify God's name. So anytime it says that the children of Israel, that's not only going to define the type of people which it's going, the law is going to apply to, but it's also going to be showing that uh, this is a law that is only for 
uh, the Jewish people itself. This is not just saying, oh, go talk to the, the, Jew, the, the, pe the Jewish people. This is really meaning that this is a law that applies only to the Jewish people, and this would be a case like that as well. This is only incumbent on Jews, not non-Jews. Now, the Gemara is going to get a different source for this ruling, and Rabbi Nasa, in the name of Rabbi Lazar, derives this ruling from the following verse, where it says, and this is going to be in Kings 5.18, uh, Kings 2, 5.18, and it's going to say, uh, for this thing may God pardon your servant, for when my master comes to Bet Rimon to bow there, and he leans on my arm, and I shall bow down too. The next verse continues with Elisha's reply, and he said to him, Go in peace. And so in the fifth chapter of Kings 2, it's relating that when consulting the prophet Elisha about his sickness, Naman, who was not Jewish, was told to bathe seven times in the Jordan River. And following this advice, there was a, an amazing, miraculous recovery. And Naaman gave up idol worship, but he pleaded that God pardon him for one thing. And when accompanying the king of Aram to his God's temple in Bet Rimon, he will be forced to bow before the idol as he supports the king who prostrates himself. And Elisha says to Naaman, go in peace. In other words, um, this go in peace is implying that he's, he's allowing Naaman to bow before an idol rather than sacrifice his life. And so we can see here that a non-Jew is not commanded to sacrifice his life in order to sanctify Shem's name. So that's a, a really a deep idea. And so that's what really the Gemara finishes up. It says from here we learn that Jews are commanded to sacrifice their lives in order to sanctify God's name, but a non-Jew is not commanded to sacrifice their life in order to sanctify God's name. So tomorrow we're going to finish up this halakha, we're going to get into a related incident, and we're going to get into this conversation between Bet Shemai and Bet Hillel. Have a great day.